If you have your Bibles, <laughs> I'm going to say this, and some of you are probably going to laugh at me. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is where we are today. Uh, if, you, if you know, if you're familiar with this, this is, this is the love passage in the Scriptures. Now, what's interesting here, though, is that very often the, the love passage, the 1 Corinthians 13, the love passage is read most commonly where? At a wedding. But get this, this passage has very little to do with weddings. <laughs> in fact, 1 Corinthians 13 specifically is about God's people oriented with love towards one another in the context of the local church. It's not just marriage, although I'm sure if this was a Venn diagram, marriage would be under some of the overlapping portions. I'm sure that that would be true, but we're not talking explicitly about marriage here. And the more pertinent section that we'd be dealing with is church membership. So this is actually a great Sunday for this. First Corinthians chapter 13, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We're going to read verses 1 through 13 in First Corinthians chapter 13. Verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love... I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and if I deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, though like, thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you teach and instruct us by your word. I pray that you would do so faithfully this morning and help us to submit to you in joy. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Before we jump in today, I think it's important that we start by defining some terms. First off, when we talk about tongues, we're not talking about the contemporary charismatic definition of this word, which is not in the Bible anywhere. We're actually talking about the supernatural ability to speak a language that you didn't know yet. That's what a tongue is. Whenever the New Testament refers to a tongue, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about you speaking a language that you did not know how to speak before. And this is why it's very important that inside of the context of the New Testament church, whenever this gift was being practiced, there was also the requirement that there be a translator present to accurately say what has been spoken in a tongue. Is everybody following with me so far? Prophecy means to speak without error the word of God. That's prophecy. Prophecy means to speak without error the word of God. Pop quiz. Do you know what happens to a prophet whenever they get it wrong? You kill them. That's Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 through 22. You can go verify that yourself. So if somebody comes up to you today and says that they are a prophet, you should be loving to them and caution them and say, hey, you know, if we get, you get it wrong, we're supposed to kill you, right? <laughs> Everybody just got real nervous. <laughs> I just got real nervous. It also says here that we are to understand all mysteries and knowledge. What that means is, is that we have a higher insight, a high, high insight into God's word and wisdom. So we've got supernatural gifts, tongues. We've got supernatural gifts of prophecy, both restrained within the biblical definitions of what the Bible gives us, and we have the, the ability to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, which means we have incredible insight into God's Word and wisdom. But here's the kicker in the text. 
You can have all of this and go to hell. You can have tongues. You can have prophecy. You can have unparalleled insight into the Word of God and to the wisdom of God. And you can still go to hell. The way that it says it in the text, it says you gain nothing. In other words, you inherit nothing. In other words, you are not a child of God because you don't have the inheritance of God, and therefore you are, as we're going to discuss later on in the sermon, a son of Satan. Jesus even goes as far to say, you are a son of your father, the devil. Balaam's donkey was even a prophet. Did you know that? Did you know Balaam's donkey was a prophet? He was. Because what did Balaam's donkey do? He spoke without error the words of God. Side note, we don't ordain donkeys to be pastors. But, you know, we'll talk about that another time. Think about this. You can know a lot. You can understand the mysteries and you can still miss the boat to heaven. And here's here's the real thing that ought to concern us. You are judged more harshly in proportion to how much you understand. Did you know that? The Bible teaches us that the more that we understand, the more that we are held accountable before God. And this text tells us that you can have all of these gifts and incredibly high understanding and still burn in hell. And not only do you burn in hell, but your fire is hotter. So if you know a lot and you refuse to repent and you have no love, your hell is hotter. Pursuit of biblical knowledge apart from love, and if you remember correctly, we defined love last week according to the way that Jesus defines it, which love is not a squishy, warm, gushy feeling. Um, That's what Disney tells you, okay? That's not true. Love is not a squishy, warm, gushy feeling that you have for someone or something. Love is an action. By this we know love that one would lay down his life for his friends. There was an action that Jesus took to define what love was. Uh, we, we use the expression of love, just to review from last week, we use the expression of love, we, we fall in and out of love. No, that's you fall in and out of your feelings. That's not love. Love is a, an action that you take. Love is a, a giving of yourself for the good of someone else. Love is a, a sacrifice of your preference, of your life in some instances for other people. Love is an action, not a feeling, right? Amen? Love is an action, not a feeling. But I don't love my, I don't know, spouse anymore. Well, what you actually mean to say is, I don't have warm, gushy feelings for my spouse anymore, but you can still love them according to the Bible. You can still lay your life down and your preferences down for them. But I don't, I don't feel right when I do that. I don't care about your feelings. Amen. What I care about is, are we walking in faithful obedience to what God says? And here's the thing. Your feelings will follow your actions consistently. The Bible says, what about your heart and about your feelings? That your heart is desperately sick and deceitful. Who can know it? But you can train and curve your heart and your feelings, your emotions in a particular direction based on your actions. God has taught us to love by doing, not by feeling. But I don't feel like I'm being authentic to myself whenever I do things like that. Okay, you're a sinner. (laughs) You, You live life by undoing the bad things and moving more to the good things. You are being unmade and remade in the image of Jesus. That's the point of being a Christian. You don't let your heart guide you. Your heart sends you to hell. You let the Word of God guide you, and you obey it, and you repent, and you follow what He says. That's the standard, not how you feel. Man, that would be a terrible life to live. Because i got to tell you, some days I wake up and I feel great, and I feel like helping everybody, and I feel like honoring everybody, and I feel like loving everybody, and I feel like doing what I'm supposed to do. And some days I wake up, and I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to look at you. I don't want to see you. I don't want you to call me. I don't want to call you. You see the difference? 
If you let your life be determined by your feelings, you actually don't know how to love at all. Love is an action, not a feeling. Love is what we do, not how we feel. Pursuit of biblical knowledge apart from love, apart from applying this biblical knowledge faithfully to your life and to your immediate circumstances, actually makes your life worse. Do you get it? It makes your hell hotter. It makes things worse for you. Now, I I think that we as a church know a, a pretty fair amount of Bible. I think that we read it regularly together, which, by the way, if you're not a part of our Bible reading plan, I encourage you to do so. It starts tomorrow. You'll see a slide pop up on the screen behind me randomly throughout the day. Jump on board that plan together, and we'll all read it and enjoy this time as God's people. I think we, we know a fair amount of Bible. We read it regularly together. We, we dive deep into the text in our times of teaching and in our times of preaching. But if we don't love, meaning if that, if that Bible's not coming out of our fingertips and determining our actions... We have nothing. If we don't love, meaning if it doesn't change who we are and what we do, if, it doesn't, if we don't align our lives to its truth, we have nothing. Our hell is hotter. In other words, everything gets worse. If you are reading the Bible just so that you can be smart and know Bible stuff and be one of the smarter people in the room, you are imbibing judgment onto yourself. Do you hear me? If you don't have love, which means if that Bible is not changing who you are and what you do, you've got nothing, and you're in fact making your life worse. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe you do do some things. Maybe you, maybe you start institutions. Maybe you, maybe you start schools or hospitals or, or nonprofits or, or Christian clubs. Maybe you start churches. Maybe you, maybe you do some, some good stuff, at least what the world would call good stuff uh, around us. Maybe, maybe you eradicate poverty, and maybe you, you, you take a bite out of homelessness, and maybe, maybe you, you help to, to push hunger farther and farther away in the world. Maybe you do some, some good things according to the standards of the world around us, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. Which means if you're not carrying the truth of God into every single sphere and every crevice of your life and the life of those around you that which you have influence over, you're doing nothing. You're making it worse for them. You're bringing judgment upon them. How is that possible, Pastor Stewart? We've defeated hunger and homelessness and poverty. Okay, first off, no, you didn't, okay? Because the Bible says, Jesus says that the poor will what? Always be with you. You didn't defeat it because as long as there is sin in the world, there will be poverty, there will be homelessness, there will be hunger. I do believe that the church will push it down and push it down and push it down and push it down until eventually the returning of Jesus. I do think that's true, but you ain't eradicating it. You fed some people. You, you gave some folks a place to stay. And maybe you, you even helped a few folks find work. But let me tell you the most important piece. If God's truth was not proclaimed to them, then no matter what you've done, they have nothing. You could feed them. You could house them. You could educate them. You could help them find work. But if God's truth was not proclaimed to them, The Bible says they have nothing. They have nothing. If they had no real opportunity to be convicted by the word of God and to repent of their sins and put their faith into Jesus, then just give them a few months and they will be right back where they were because that sin is still there. In other words, If you didn't tell them the truth, you didn't really love them in the first place. You used them. You didn't love them. You used them. Which means that if this is you, you aren't far from the type of guy that gives a homeless folk some cash and maybe a sandwich and then 
makes a video of themselves doing it and puts it on the internet. You're not that different. Maybe you didn't do exactly that, but you're not too far upstream from that. Your help to them wasn't actually for their own gain, and often it was actually for yours. Let me explain that to you. Maybe you did it so that you would feel better about yourself. Look at all these good things that I've done in the world. Maybe, maybe you did it so that, so that you could get a little bit of the guilt off of your shoulders. See, no, look, I am contributing to society. See how I'm trying to help? You see, that's about you. That's not about them. Do you get it? That's about what, how you feel, not about how they feel or about their circumstances. Or maybe you did it so that you could get a little bit more public prestige, you know, have your name pop up on one of those thank you to our volunteers slides or something like that. Or maybe you did it to get a promotion at your place of work. Maybe your place of work requires these things of you. Or maybe, maybe you wanted to score a few points with a local nonprofit. Maybe you wanted to pad your resume. Maybe you wanted tax deductions. Or maybe you just gave the guy $20 on the side of the road so that he would stop looking at you. You didn't help them. You didn't help them. Because it was devoid of truth. Do you get it? Real love means sacrifice. True service involves putting yourself, your comfort, your desires, your wants second to what someone else really needs. Real love involves being loving with them through and through. And it's not love for your own benefit. Real love is aligned with God's truth and it proclaims God's truth. Real love that's worth something carries eternal weight. Real love requires the truth of God. Today is June 2nd. Today is the second day of the demonic onslaught that is Pride Month. It has begun. The dam has busted, so to speak. God burns cities to the ground for this type of behavior. And our nation as a whole is celebrating it. Our nation as a whole is pressuring you to celebrate it. Or at very least, pressuring you to be quiet about it while everyone else celebrates it. Politicians, athletes, celebrities are blacklisted for not celebrating it. Our family business has even been fired by some of our clients in the past for refusing to participate in it. So what's the proper response, Christian? What do we do? Pastor, you said that we're supposed to speak the truth, so how do we do this? We speak the truth in love. And if you refuse to speak truth to your family who is lost in it, to our city and governments who are endorsing it, to the public square that is filled with Christians whose backbones are too squishy to have the courage to speak prophetically to the world around them, if you don't desire their repentance, if you don't plead with God to cover and guide your words like an arrow to their hearts, then you don't actually love them. You hate them. And you want them to burn in hell forever. Do you see how drastically different the Christian worldview is? We don't want them to leave with nothing. We want them to leave with something. And that requires us to say what is true. It requires us. It does not present it to us as an option. It does not give us the, the possibility of maybe having a conversation one day. God burned cities to the ground for this. And your silence towards those who would walk in this life is towards their destruction. If you do not love, then there is blood on your hands. We as God's people must love, real love, faithful love, like the Bible tells us to respond with. The Bible says that if we don't do this, it's actually because we have nothing. Do you get it? Listen to me. The Bible says that if you refuse to love, 
then it's you who is empty inside. Then it's you who has nothing. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? See, there it is again. Do you see it? Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, these people had no, no problem saying things like Jesus is king. They had no problem with that. They, they, they had no problem calling him Lord, right? Because they, they, that's what Lord means, king. Lord, Lord, king, king. They had no problem saying that. They, they, they were good in their soteriology. They were, these were good, reformed folk right here. Like They had solid doctrine. They were following the Lord Jesus. They were lined up and ready to go. They did great things in the name of Jesus. But they had nothing. They prophesied. They cast out demons. They did great and amazing works, but they were worthless and hell-bound. And notice... If you look closely at verse 22, Jesus doesn't say some. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Meaning, there's a lot. There's a lot of people who think that they are following Jesus, but they have no love. There are a lot of people who think that they're doing all these great and mighty works in the name of Jesus, but they have no love because they have no truth. There are a lot of people who believe that they are Christians, but they are on the fast train to hell. And we live surrounded by them. They are workers of lawlessness. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? They're workers of lawlessness. Well, what's the summary of the law? Do you remember? What's the summary of the law? We talked about this last week. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor, what? As yourself. I don't want to go to hell. Do you want to go to hell? I don't want to go to hell. So what does that mean I need to do? I need to tell people how to not go there. (laughs) And I need to tell people that they need to repent and follow the Lord Jesus in all of life and, and, and embrace His truth above all else. This is the calling of what it means to be a Christian. They have no love. They are works of lawlessness. They have no law. They have no Savior. They have no faith. They have nothing. They have nothing. Faith without love is nothing. Okay. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Okay, I got it. I'm worried, Pastor, that I don't have love. I need, I need that. So where do, I, where do I get that from? Galatians chapter 5, verses 22. You can just write that down. I'm going to read it to you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. You can just write it down. I'm going to read it to you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, self-control. It lists all the things out. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first one on the list? The fruit of the Spirit is love, which means if you have the seed of the Spirit in you, then what comes out of your fingertips? Real love. If you, have the fruit of the, if you have the seed of the Spirit planted in you, then the fruit of the Spirit that works its way out of you is love. Love and submission to God's Word and proclaiming His Word to the world around you. So if you really love in truth, then you are of God. You are of His people. You love like Jesus only if you have the Spirit of God in your life. Only if you are truly His. So if you don't love like Jesus which involved the occasional table throwing, if you don't love like Jesus, then you don't have the Spirit in your heart. If you don't love like Jesus, you have nothing. Now, here's the deal. Maybe you're relatively new to this Christianity thing, okay? You haven't been a Christian for very long, or at the very least, you haven't been connected to a biblical church for very long. 
And whenever you walk into, I always, I just love whenever we have new people who come and visit Christ Church. I really do. Because the expression on their face for the first couple of Sundays in a row is like somebody who's drinking from a fire hose. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they're just like, whoa, okay, got it. But if you just make it through like the first three, four, five weeks, you're like, oh, I think this is starting to click. I think I'm starting to follow now. And so what I'm saying is if you're relatively new to biblical Christianity, if you're relatively new to being able to drinking from the fire hose, maybe you don't see it in your life just yet. Maybe it's just not there yet. It's not, it's not manifesting itself in the way that it ought to be manifesting itself. I don't see this yet. Over time, you will. Over time, you will. Because, listen, how long does it take fruit to grow on a tree? A uh, long time, right? I mean, I mean, think about it. Like most trees grow for years and years before they produce a good crop of fruit. That's just that's just that's just regular biology. In fact, uh, in the Old Testament, they were commanded to to snip the the blossoms, the fruits off of trees for the first three, four, five years of their life, and then in the next year they would offer all the fruit to God, and then the following year after that, then they would be able to take the fruit. They would actually take the fruit uh, in and be able to eat some of it. So we're talking years of trajectory of faithfulness before you really see good fruit in your life. Amen. That's real. That's real life. That's real talk. And uh, sometimes I, I get to visit with relatively new converts. This is the beauty of being in a church like ours is we have people who come to faith in Jesus all the time from all different walks of life. We've got folks who thought they were a Christian for their whole life and they actually weren't. We've got folks who were, who were straight up leaving Jesus behind, didn't want anything to do with him, who eventually convert to him. We've got all these people in the room with us. And I love getting to hang out with them for the first few months of their, of their conversions because I inevitably get to have the conversation with them where they say to me, I don't think I'm changing. And I say, how long have you been doing this? And they're like, two months. And I'm like, it's going to be okay. You wanna, let's go have lunch. We'll talk. I, I remember one time I, I was ministering to a particular person who was dealing with a type of addiction. And they were like, my life's over. I'm, I've relapsed. I've used again. And I remember talking to him about it. I was like, you used again recently? He was like, yeah, I did last week. I said, oh, man, that's a bummer. I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, how long has it been since you, you know, had a relapse before? And he was like, six months. I was like, oh, is, it, is this the longest you've, you've ever gone without using? They're like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I think you're on a good trajectory, buddy. I'm sorry that this happened. Let's confess and repent and move forward and trust the Lord. You see, like, that's, that's the trajectory of a Christian. It doesn't mean I prayed a prayer, now I'm perfect, but there's an up and to the right growth trajectory that produces fruit over the course of years. Pastor, I don't think I have any love. If you've got the Spirit in you, you will. You will. Just give it time and be faithful and confess and repent of your sin and follow the Lord. And you'll see it. You'll see it. You're sitting in a room full of it right now. Right now. There are people who are 10, 15, 20 years down the road from you in this room right now who will testify to the grace and mercy and work of Jesus by putting love into their heart and seeing that love come out of their fingertips into the world around them. It will happen. If you're really His, it will happen. It will. It will. You see, that's, that's the difference between having faith in the Lord and not. God says, if you trust him, he will put his seed of spirit in you and you will grow fruit from out of your fingertips. He said that. He said it will happen. And so what do you as his people do? Well, it hasn't happened yet, so I quit. Nope, that's not faith. That's not faith. Faith says, it's coming. I'm struggling right now. It's been hard lately. But I see the trajectory. I see the hope. I see the future. I see my children growing up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I see my marriage restored to the joy and grace that it is that Jesus has commanded us to have. And I see fruit of joy and peace and love coming out of my fingertips. You will see it over time. And you want to know what the beautiful thing of being a covenant member of a church is? Other people will too. And they'll tell you. And they'll tell you. 
time will tell, and fruit grows over time. And not only does it grow, but it continues. Chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, it says, let brotherly love continue. It, it doesn't just, you just don't pop out a little piece of fruit over time and then you're done. Woo, I did it. I got some fruit. Done. No, it, it continues. It's, it's an up and to the right trajectory. Sanctification means that you grow in holiness throughout your life. And that means that your fruit grows and it matures and it becomes heavier. And that also means to be a good fruit tree that continues to produce, what has to happen to good fruit trees? You get pruned. I literally just watched some of you go, yeah, I know, it's okay, you're going to be all right. This is why you need faithful Christians who have been faithful Christians for a long time to be around you and in covenant with you, so that when you go through the storm and you get pruned, you can have somebody who can say, hey, brother, that was me like two years ago. It's going to be okay. The Lord uses this to make you more fruitful later. And one more note on fruit real quick, one more note real quick. Okay, love, uh, joy, peace, patience. Fruit is a, a good gift, but baskets of fruit are also heavy. And so whenever you start having a fruitful life and you feel like, ooh, this is getting heavy, amen. Amen. Right? Things were going great in my life until I got all these kids. There's, there's so many of them. Amen. We should like have competitions, you know, at the end of our lives, like whenever we're all great grandparents, to see how hard it is to fit all of our family into one photo. That should be our goals. Like, how far back does the camera guy have to go to get us all into one shot? That needs to be the competition. That would be that would be great. That'd be great. I think we know who's in the lead already. Moving on. But there's more to it than that, actually. Revelation chapter two. I'm going to read you verses four through six. But I have this against you. Listen, listen. This is the words of Jesus. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Okay? So you see what I'm saying? So you, you had love. You had fruit. And Jesus' chastisement specific, specifically in Revelation chapter 2 is that, that now you've stopped. You've stopped. You've abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. You see it? Love's not a feeling. Love is what you do. Got it? Do, repent and do the works that you did at the beginning. Love's not a squishy feeling. Love is what you do. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. All right, now get this. This is interesting. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. Write this down someplace, okay, because this is a big deal. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Did you see that? Jesus commended his people in Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, for hating something because Jesus said, because I also hate it. Now notice, we need to pay something kind of close attention to this text. He says, the works of the Nicolaitans. He doesn't say the Nicolaitans. Do you get it? Okay, I, that's worth noticing. And it's also worth noticing that he first premises it based on love, and he says hate. Now, here, here's the problem. Biblical love includes hate within its purview. Do You got it? Biblical love includes hate. Now, we get, um, we get love and hate convoluted uh, because I think we attribute both of them to a lack of self-control. Uh, I'm going to try and define this really carefully. We get love and hate um, convoluted, biblical definitions convoluted, because I think that we attribute both of them to a lack of self-control. And here's what I mean. He was so angry, he lost it. You get what I'm saying? And we think that's hate. We think that's what we should do. That's what Christian hate should be. Do you get what I'm saying? That we just, we can't control ourselves anymore and we, we lash out. But that can't be it, because that's not what the Bible says about love. But yet that's what our world says about love. They loved each other so much, they just couldn't control themselves anymore. That's not Bible. That's not biblical. See, that, we think that love and hate are just feelings, okay? 
And, and that the, we feel a certain way and our feelings propel us towards a particular action and those actions are either lashing out or unrestrained lust. And you're like, see, look, I've, I've loved so much that I can't control myself or I've hated so much that I've lashed out against the thing. That's not biblical love or hate. Biblical love and biblical hate are required by God for us as actions in the world. And if they're required by us, by God, excuse me, for us as actions, then that means in order for us to execute them, you must be controlled, restrained. This is why another gift of the Spirit is what? Self-control, do you see? If you, are, if, you, if you are going to be a Christian who loves biblically and hates biblically, and that means by your actions, not by your feelings taking control of you and you losing control, then that means you must have the Spirit. You must have the Spirit. Because the Spirit is how you do this. The Spirit is how this works. The Spirit is where you get all of this power from. Real love, biblical love, hates because biblical love, real love, submits to Scripture, not your feelings. Real love, biblical love, hates Because biblical love submits to Scripture and not your feelings. Real love and real hate is an action that we perform in submission to Jesus and in submission to His Word. Real love, to love like Jesus loves, means that there are things in the world that you should hate, according to the Bible. Not according to you being angry and losing control of yourself. That's not biblical hate. Do you understand? Biblical hate means that you apply properly what the Bible commands you to do. I hate this sin because it destroys people's lives. I hate the enemy and I hate the mechanisms of the enemy that go after our brothers and sisters and the world at large. But what does it mean to hate them? Not to get emotional, not to lash out. No, it means we do what the Bible says. We control ourselves, we honor the Lord, and we do what he calls us to do. 1 Corinthians 5. We turned him over to Satan so that his soul may be saved because we hate the sin in his heart. We control ourselves. We honor the Lord. And we do what he has told us to do. And if we have sinned in our own hearts, what do we do? We hate it. This is why the Bible teaches us to be violent against sin. If your hand causes you to sin, do what? Now, obviously, this is a metaphor that Jesus gave us because we don't hear about the New Testament church being the church of the one-handed brothers, right? Nobody said that. So he's speaking in metaphor here. But his point is that our fight against sin should be a violent one, and it starts here. It starts here. It starts with yourself. If there is sin in your own heart, then you hate it, and you fight violently against it. And we confess it and we repent of it, and we do so violently. And then we gather all our brothers and sisters together, and we hand them bats, and we say, here's the sin I'm fighting with. Will you help me kill this? And we swing. And if we have sin in our households, we hate that sin, and we confront it lovingly, firmly, and violently. If our brother or sister falls into sin, we love them enough to hate the sin that has them captive. And we confront them with the truth of Scripture because we love them and because we hate the enemy. When our neighbors are sending themselves to hell, we obey the Great Commission. And we teach them to obey all that Jesus commands them to do. Because that's what the Great Commission says. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Teach all nations. Teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. Amen? Go read it. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. That's what it says. Anything less than that is not love. It's not love. We proclaim what is true. We are faithful with everything within our purview. And insofar as the Lord gives us opportunity, we take ground. That's love. That's love. Real love comes from submission to Jesus and his word 
and nowhere else. Real love knows the truth. Real love believes the truth. Real love proclaims the truth. Real love practices the truth. Real love submits to the truth. But it starts, it starts with knowing it. I I really hope that you hang around in this church and get to hear some of the stories of the faithful brothers and sisters that have gone before you about how they followed 1 Corinthians 5 and they've even gone so far as to hand their own children over to Satan so that their soul may be saved and then guess what? Their soul was saved because God is gracious. Real love starts with knowing it and then it believes it, proclaims it, practices it and submits to the truth in all of life. And in John chapter 8, and I do want you to turn here. I do want you to turn to John chapter 8 with me. In John chapter 8, Jesus actually brings one of the harshest rebukes he ever brings to those that would claim to love, to those who would claim to know the truth, but who are actually not loving. This is John chapter 8, and it starts in verse 31. And I want you to read along with me as we kind of walk through this together. John chapter 8 starts in verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And if you know the truth, then the truth will set you free. You all know this passage. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How could you say that we will become free? See, this is triggering for them because now Jesus, by his statement, is implying that they don't know the truth yet and that as a result they are also enslaved. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham. Yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father. Verse 39, and they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to him, said to them, excuse me, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. In other words, you would love, right? You'd be doing the works that Abraham did, but now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You do the works that your father did. And they said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Verse 42, 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would what? Love me. And the Bible says, if you love Jesus, you'll do what? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If, you, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Lies, but because I tell the truth, because I love, you do not believe me. You see what's happening there? They hated him when they should have loved him because they hated what was true. Jesus loved them and rebuked them because he said what is true. Do you see what's going on here? And they hated him, and they killed him. And as a result, his faithful love saved the world. Do you see what just happened? He rebuked them with the truth because he loved them. They hated him because they hated the truth. And as a result, they killed him, and God wove it all together so that Jesus' faithful love to those who wouldn't even hear would still save the world. Do you get it? Your proclamation of truth may not win the day. Do you understand? 
Your proclamation of truth to the person to whom you are speaking may not win them. But it will change the world. See, we, we have turned this work of gospel present, uh, presentation, of, of telling people the law and the commands of God, we have turned this into a pragmatic, well, if I'm not going to win them, then why should I even say it? Jesus knew he wasn't going to win. He knew he wasn't going to win. He knew they were going to kill him. He said what was true anyway, and he laid down his life in a sacrifice of love for us. Do you get it? So your proclamation of the truth is not just a proclamation of love to the person who would hear you, but to the world itself. You can change the world by simply saying what is true. And you may not win the fight with the person with which you're speaking. You may not win the soul of the person to which you're speaking. Who cares? Because the truth is what sets people free. And the truth will prevail. And it might cost you your job. It might cost you your reputation. It might cost you the future of your family reunions. It might cost you some friends. It might cost you all of those things. So be it. But truth is how we change the world. And if we sit in silence because we are afraid of the repercussions or potentially not winning the soul of the person to who we are proclaiming the truth to, we don't love anybody. We don't. It's not just about the one-way conversation. The truth sets people free. Jesus loved them. He rebuked them from his love, and they hated him, and they killed him, and it's by his death that the world was saved. Your proclamation of truth might cost you everything, but I guarantee you, for Christians, there's a resurrection. You might lose your job. You might lose everything. You might lose your reputation. You might lose all of it. So be it. Because Jesus wants his church to be faithful. And it's by the sowing of the seed of truth that his gospel is proclaimed. And the world has an opportunity to repent and be transformed. To love like Jesus means that you put yourself second. You give of yourself to be willing to be maligned and rejected for the sake of the gospel is a fundamental truth of Christianity. It is who we are because it's what our Savior did. He was maligned and rejected for his proclamation of the truth. He looked the enemy in the eye and said, you are a son of your father, the devil. And they killed him for it. And the world was saved. Why did the church so righteously expand throughout Rome and throughout all of the West? Why? Because they got that. And they were fed to lions, and they were skinned alive, and they were put into the Colosseums, and they were burned as torches in Nero's garden at night, and the church exploded. Because they loved like Jesus Because they put their reputations second. Because they put their careers second. Because they put their friendships second. And the kingdom of Christ first. Unless, unless a grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies, there will be no fruit. That's Bible. It is like a type of death for us to proclaim God's truth in this way. Yes, it is a type of death. But for Christians, there is a resurrection. You want to gain ground in the world? We sing songs, shout on, pray on, we're gaining ground. You want to gain ground in the world? You got to put yourself second your job second, your reputation second, your family second, and you love first. We follow his example. We love well enough to say what is true despite the costs because he did it for you. 
and because we know that God will bless it because he already has for 2,000 years. Shout on, pray on. We are gaining ground. Let's pray.